and a very warm welcome to today's webinar, Combating Disinformation, Empowering African Youth for Peace and Security, presented by the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. I'm Dr. Mark Dirksen, a research associate at the Africa Center and the lead of our line of effort to understand and counter disinformation. I'm thrilled that you've decided to join us today for this timely conversation and a special welcome to all of our Africa Center alumni in the audience. I would like to thank Dr. Joel Amegba, who leads the Africa Center's Youth Peace and Security Portfolio for granting us this forum for our conversation. Um, and I encourage everyone to watch his previously recorded webinars in this series. We have four excellent panelists whom you'll hear from shortly each working to uncover and combat disinformation in different yet complementary ways. But before kicking us off and introducing them, it is my pleasure to first give the floor to the Africa Center's director, Ms. Amanda Dory. It's a pleasure to greet you today from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies here on the snowy campus of the National Defense University in Washington, DC. My name is Amanda Dory, and I have the honor to serve as the Africa Center's director. I'm very pleased to greet so many Africa Center alumni, youth, and special partners from all over the African continent and well beyond. We're delighted to partner today with the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center's Women, Youth, Peace, and Security Institute. And it's truly a pleasure to greet Major General Richard Otto Gianni again, and to be joined by an excellent panel to discuss the part that youth can play in social resilience to the ever-growing problem of dis and misinformation. As we know, societies and governance structures are under pressure all over the world, and comparative learning can help us in identifying solutions as we see youth activism and participation as a key resource. First slide, please. Just very briefly, as some of you may know, the Africa Center was chartered by the US Congress 25 years ago. We conduct academic programs and research related to the full range of security challenges in Africa. The vision that we're working towards is security for all Africans championed by effective institutions that are accountable to their citizens, including those who aren't old enough to vote yet. Our program today is conducted in support of that vision and using our methodology of dialogue, peer learning, and seeking to catalyze strategic solutions. Second slide, please. I wanted to share with you the full range of issues and portfolios that the Africa Center studies and works on in the range of activities, both research and academic programs. And I've highlighted here the elements that we're focusing on today with respect to information, as well as women, youth, peace, and security. Third slide, please. Before I turn you back over to Dr. Mark Jerkson, I'd like to highlight that our website continues to publish all of our latest research at www.africacenter.org. Please check out our recent publications there or via social media. And with that, let me welcome you again and turn it back over to Dr. Jerkson to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Director Dory. I now have the honor of inviting Major General Richard Addo Johnny, Commandant of the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center to share his welcoming remarks. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, and uh, I say I'm very happy this afternoon to be in this space. So the director of the African Center for Strategic Studies, the panelists, participants, colleagues, good afternoon. On behalf of the Executive Management Committee of the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, KIPTC, I extend a warm welcome to everyone. Today marks not only the commencement of an essential dialogue on countering disinformation, but also the unveiling of the center's firm commitment to 
to empowering the youth as catalysts for peace across Africa. The Youth Peace and Security YPS program is a pillar of the Women Youth Peace and Security Institute of the Center. Youth Peace and Security Institute at the Center. It um, recognizes the pivotal role that young people play in shaping the future of our continent. The youth are not just passive recipients of peace, they are active architects of stability, bringing fresh perspectives, unwavering enthusiasm, and innovative solutions to complex challenges. The program seeks to harness the tremendous potential by providing platforms, tools, and knowledge for the youth to effectively contribute to conflict prevention, resolution, and sustainable peace building. As we gather here today, we acknowledge the pivotal role that information plays in shaping opinions, decisions, and ultimately our societies. In this digital era, the scourge of disinformation presents a profound threat to the stability and cohesion of our societies. It is imperative that we equip ourselves with the skills to navigate the, this landscape of misinformation by fostering critical thinking, media literacy, and ethical information sharing practices. We fortify our collective resilience against the harmful impacts of disinformation. In the context of peace and security, the dissemination of false narratives can escalate tension, erode trust, and disrupt the delicate balance required for sustainable peace. In this interconnected world, combating disinformation demands a concerted effort from the various sectors. That is governments, civil society, academia, and the private sector, working collaboratively to safeguard the integrity of information. Today's webinar serves as a platform to harness collective wisdom, innovative strategies, and shared experiences in tackling disinformation. At the KIPTC, we recognize the agency to address this challenge, particularly concerning the impact on peace and security across Africa. Our commitment to fostering dialogue, enhancing critical thinking, and equipping emerging leaders with the tools to discern facts from fiction remains unwavering. I would like to express our sincere appreciation to, to Dieter Dori and the African Center for their unwavering support and collaboration in making today's event possible. Their commitment to nurturing the next generation of peace builders aligns seamlessly with our shared vision of empowering the youth and amplifying their voices in the pursuit of peace and security. I extend my deepest gratitude to our esteemed panelists and all participants for joining us on this momentous occasion. Let us leverage this platform to champion truth, dialogue, and collaboration in countering disinformation and paving the way for a more peaceful Africa. I want to thank you for your commitment to peace and to the cause of peace in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General Gianni. Um, and I share Director Dory and General Gianni's emphasis on the importance and really the urgency, um, the urgency to move from theory to practice. These um, disinformation attacks are happening right now and require a response. Um, and it's a question of disinformation, but also youth demographics and the peace and security landscape on the continent. And as I was, I was getting ready for this webinar, I was thinking about the technology that's brought us all together today for this conversation and thinking about how this digital forum 
um, where we're gathering is not unlike many of the new online spaces that millions of young people are building and using every day across Africa. And this virtual webinar is really an example of one of these new mediums of communication and information sharing that have emerged incredibly rapidly in just the past few years, um, which I think is now easy to forget and just to take for granted that this is how we communicate. Um, but it, it's really a, quite a, a novel technology, um, as are so many of our digital platforms. And these, these platforms are being used for bridging great distances, for bringing people together for constructive, um, factual and good faith exchanges like we're planning to have today. And the vast majority of Africa's now over 400 million active social media users, which is up from just 100 million um, in 2016, are seeking to create digital spaces like this, where reliable information can be shared, where connections can be made, um, and where people can learn about history, science, and have conversations about the topics of the day. Um, for example, about Africa's 18 presidential elections happening this year, um, which a little plug to check out our, our newest publication on our website, um, previewing those elections. Um, and even to use these spaces, to come together on these spaces, whether it's Zoom, um, WhatsApp, Facebook groups, or other new platforms, um, to make change and create social movements, like we saw with the online organized NSARS protest, um, demanding better governance, demanding police reform in Nigeria a few years ago. But it's precisely because these spaces are so powerful um, and so potentially transformative in their ability to reach and connect users that they're being targeted and hijacked by disinformation actors, um, both foreign actors and domestic political actors who seek to intentionally sabotage and manipulate the information that citizens see and share in their everyday lives. And these actors have been quite savvy. They've um, developed an arsenal of really quite sophisticated techniques and tactics to derail these online conversations, from bot armies um, to the cloning and impersonation of media outlets to the gaming of trending hashtags. And for several years now, the Africa Center has tracked a list of what are now 84, over 84, publicly detected and documented large-scale disinformation campaigns targeting African information spaces. So we see this happening, we have documentation, um, and we continue to publish analyses of a number of these campaigns on our website. And what we're seeing is that these campaigns are driving both on and offline harms. They are negatively impacting our democracies, trust in institutions, and African peace and security. When our ability to communicate and the factual basis for that, for that communication is distorted and begins to break down, conflicts can quickly escalate and become much harder to put back in the box through peace processes and dialogue. And young people are living this reality and are trying to find this, their bearings in this, this new world um, and find ways to have their voices heard in societal conversations and have their voices not be drowned out by waves of conspiracies or coordinated inauthentic behavior. And there's starting to be promising signs of a turning tide, I think, as African researchers, journalists, fact checkers, civil society organizations learn how to defend against disinformation. And we see young people on the continent really taking the lead in innovating these efforts. So I wanted to talk today to several leading practitioners and experts who are doing this work, who are at the forefront of efforts to deepen African agency and resilience on this issue. I've asked our guests, whom I'll introduce now, to share a little bit about their organizations and the work they're doing to understand and combat the challenge of disinformation. Our first speaker will be Mr. Edmund Okoto Bampo, the Senior Program Officer at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Before joining KAIPTC, Edmund founded and led the Center for Security Policy and Research as its Executive Director. He has been a youth leader and activist for over a decade, serving in diverse roles in several organizations, 
like the All Africa Students Union and the National Association of Nigerian Postgraduate Students. He is the Chief of Bureau for Africa at UCLA's Journal on World Affairs. Edmund holds a Master's in Conflict, Peace, and Security from the Kofi Annan Training Center. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Kunle Adebajo, who heads the investigations desk at Humangle, a media establishment covering Africa's conflict and development trends. Kunle has documented the Boko Haram crisis and its humanitarian fallout for several years. He also writes about disinformation, the environment, and human rights. Um, and he writes quite beautifully um, and quite thoughtfully on those issues. Kunle has won several journalism awards, including the 2021 Wally Shuenka Award for Investigative Journalism and the 2023 Michael Elliott Award for Excellence in African Storytelling. Kunle is passionate about innovative journalism and how it can help bring attention to critical problems as well as lead to lasting reforms. Our next speaker will be Ms. Vanessa Manesung, who is an investigative data analyst and researcher at the ANCIR iLab team at Code for Africa. Her work involves researching and uncovering disinformation campaigns, coordinated inauthentic behavior, and transnational organized crime operating in online media. Vanessa trains Code for Africa fellows in newsrooms on topics such as influence operations, and detecting coordinated inauthentic behavior in social networks using open source investigative tools. And our final speaker will be Ms. Harriet Ofori, who serves as a research and project manager at Pen Plus Bytes, where she leverages her expertise in communication in languages. Currently, she is actively engaged with her team in um, really a, a very promising and innovative project examining disinformation in West Africa. Harriet has also contributed to her organization's initiatives in Ghana, focusing on media and information literacy projects. So welcome to our esteemed panelists. It's good to see you all again. And Edmund, I would like to start with you. Um, I'd like if you could kick us off and briefly help us lay out what disinformation is. Um, help define it for us, help distinguish it from misinformation in more traditional forms of propaganda. Um, and I'd also like you to highlight some of the effects driven by disinformation that you're seeing and tracking with the Kofi Annan Center. So in other words, um, please help us understand, kind of lay out the problem for us and why it's a topic that the Kofi Annan Training Center is paying such close attention to. Thank you very much, Mark. And um, I've been reading and Mark, um, your, I'd like to start from your, your work, which identifies that 60% of documented disinformation cases um, emanate externally from Africa, when you deal with Africa. Quickly, both misinformation and disinformation deal with false information. However, the distinguishing feature of disinformation is that disinformation is intentional. Um, it's often malicious. It is calculated to cause harm, to generate profits, or to get a certain gain that could not have otherwise been gained directly with the true facts. Misinformation often occurs accidentally. Let me give an example. Say a politician tweets a news item that has um, a wrong headline. The newspaper identifies this and corrects the headline. The politician is not aware that the headline has been corrected. His followers keep sharing the tweet or the publication with the wrong headline. That is classic misinformation. Let me give an example of disinformation so that we can see the distinguishing feature. And um, particularly given that Africa is now in a super year of elections, 18 elections in total. Say the opposition sends out word that the governing party have outlined schemes and mechanisms to rig the elections without substantiating it. This is 
deliberately to incite the emotions of the populace against the ruling government. It can go the other way. Um, I don't want to give specific examples, so I'm just giving generic examples. Say the governing party claims that when the opposition is elected, this will lead to chaos. The opposition have no experience in running governments and they have a grand plan to enrich themselves and drive the country's economy into the ground. Now, without any basis, this is classic disinformation. And when it happens like that, at best, people might vote against their preferred candidates. At worst, people might take arms up against their candidates or the people that they think are causing harm to their economy, causing harm to their society, and then go at them. They might not get these politicians, so they will go after the perceived supporters. This is a classic example of disinformation and its effects. When you look at even policing, you give the example of the NSAS campaign. There were numerous documented incidents of misinformation because people were showing records of things that might have happened, not necessarily by SAS, but any kind of law enforcement that did something wrong went along with the hashtag NSAS. Yes, the people meant well, but they were misinforming the public. There were cases of exaggeration. There were cases of transposing incidents of, from other geographic contexts into the context of Nigeria just to help make a case. And this might not be okay. This can lead to chaos. So there is a direct connection, documented though, direct connection between disinformation and chaos, disinformation and instability, disinformation and economic meltdown. For example, corporations and companies also use this information. They show um, PR documents as news items just to sell products. And that is disinformation for profits. So these are the examples. At the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Training Center, we are engaged in making sure that we stem the tide of disinformation. And we have started and we are doing it through, for example, this particular platform, creating platforms for discussions, making sure people are sensitized, making sure people know what is going on, the extent of the harm and what, how they can avoid it. Um, we are, through our trainings, because this is primarily a research and training center, through our trainings, we are trying to train the next generation of professionals and the current professionals on how to fight the surge of disinformation. We currently have an, a training of uh, AI for peacekeeping that we encourage as many participants as possible to register and enroll for this program. So with AI for peacekeeping, we are able to identify how AI can be a tool, a positive tool for our usual peacekeeping engagements and AI even in peacekeeping and how we can work against them. So these are some of the few inclusive of our research that Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Training Center is engaged in. Um, we'll be open for questions when it comes. Thank you very much, Edmund, um, for those definitions and excellent examples. And I appreciate you drawing the connection between disinformation proliferating and moments of crisis or chaos. Um, and I think that that is a, a really um, you know, appreciated observation and something that we've seen in kind of where disinformation sticks, where it drives offline harms, are these moments of informational flux, of fast moving events. Um, and it's why there has to be so much kind of foresight and I think um, planning around an event like an election in order to have teams in place, to have fact checkers, journalists ready um, to know that that's coming and kind of start to build guardrails. Um, so next, I'd like to turn to um, a journalist. I'd like to turn to um, you, Kunle, and I'd like to ask you to please take us into what it's like to be a journalist in Nigeria operating in this new informational landscape. 
what disinformation are you seeing? Who's sponsoring it? What disruptions are, is it causing? Um, and how are you investigating these campaigns and adapting to how you tell these stories um, in ways that reach and resonate with young people? Um, so that's a lot of questions, but kind of take uh, what you want from that and um, take us into your world as a journalist. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and I think I want to start by complimenting a bit of what Edmond said with respect to how this information fuels crisis. From my years of experience reporting conflicts, I can tell that there is hardly anything logical about war and conflict. And so for people to get people to turn on themselves to actually raise arms and kill each other, they need to radicalize them. And that's where this information comes to play, to dehumanize the other party, to exaggerate the atrocities of other people, to establish your superiority over them when there's no basis for this. Um, at Human Angle, which is where um, I've reported for the past several years, we realized that merely fact checking with disinformation or individual claims is not enough. Um, sometimes you only see one post, but this post is just a thread in a larger, bigger picture of a disinformation network. So when you, when you attack that one post, there is still a hydra-headed monster that is out there. And so we need to think of disinformation analysis on a much uh, larger scale. So it's almost like regular fact-checking can be compared to news reporting. And this information analysis is like investigative journalism in this in the field of information disorder. Uh, of course, both are important. So we need one to serve as to provide raw material for the other one, but we can't also do one without the second. Uh, we also focus on issues that have the likelihood to cause harm, uh, such as health, such as conflicts, such as some aspects of politics like election security. Now, some of the stories that we've done have focused on uh, conflict actors here in Nigeria and how they've used social media platforms to amplify their narratives, to recruit people and to legitimize their violent campaigns. Number one is a group known as the uh, Indigenous People of Biafra, IPOP, which is a, an armed separatist organization that the Nigerian government has declared as a terror, terror organization. And what we found is number one, they have a broad network of people in the diaspora who are fabricating and spreading this information through social media platforms. Um, and we also found that they tend to hide in plain sight when it comes to acts of aggression. So because they want to be seen as legitimate, they want to be seen as an activist group and not a terror organization, uh, they distance themselves from acts of aggression, which they are responsible for. And they tend to do this using disinformation and propaganda on social media. And so they modify facts and then at the same time, they're amplifying these acts of aggression while maintaining the distance. And you can only establish this from analyzing large sets of data. Uh, it also makes it easier for them to sustain their campaign of violence because in the eyes of the people, they remain a, you know, a group of freedom fighters and then they see them as people that you can support or people you can join their forces however you can. Um, and I think the lesson here is, I mean, in-depth data gathering and analysis can help us to understand conflict issues and also inform necessary solutions. So if you do not understand what is driving the violence and how they continue to sustain it, it will be difficult for policymakers to uh, address it as holistically as possible. We've also looked at the activities of jihadist organizations in Nigeria. Uh, we have affiliate groups here that uh, associate themselves with Al Qaeda. We have those who associate themselves with the Islamic State, which is known as the ISWAP, Islamic State West African Province. And there's also Boko Haram, uh, which was the umbrella group at first before this other group split out from it. And we've seen that these groups do not just operate offline, they also have activities 
extensive activities online. If you know where to look, you will find them and you find it like really the things that they do. They, uh, we looked into how they use local languages and how they mix different languages to evade moderation and content moderation on these platforms. Sometimes they codify their communication, they would add words or they would add emojis to words or their text. Sometimes they would blur their logos. Sometimes they would use names that are hard to associate with their violent campaigns. And we've realized that the, it's not just one social media group. We've seen their activities in places like Facebook. We've seen them on Telegram. We've seen it in WhatsApp. We've seen it on TikTok as well. And they use all these platforms for radicalization to get to recruit members. They use it to sermonize people. And they also share very violent and radical um, ebooks on this on these platforms. They also use bots, especially on Telegram, to automate some of these radicalization processes. And we've also seen how there's a group of armed actors in Nigeria called bandits uh, that operate, especially in the northwest and north central regions. They also have a presence on TikTok, even though we've not seen very widespread occurrences of this. And we've seen how some people uh, create imposter accounts in the name of some of these bandit leaders just to gather followers and commercialize this. But innocently, they are equally spreading uh, the messages of these groups on social media. Now, even though we've not done a lot of reporting on this, we've also researched the activities of foreign influence actors. Uh, we've seen that Russia especially has a vast disinformation network in Nigeria, even though, I mean, Nigeria is not a Francophone country where it has boats on the ground. But despite that fact, we've seen how they use local forums uh, to spread their propaganda. We've seen how they buy over Facebook groups or buy reputable media organizations to also uh, spread various uh, forms of disinformation. They've also sponsored or mobilized protests, protests um, here in Nigeria. And perhaps finally is also how political actors use uh, disinformation for their own gains. We saw this during the 2023 general elections in Nigeria. And I think the lesson here is that it will be difficult to get the government to create policies to tackle the problem when some of their own agents are also you know, the, on the front lines of using these tools and to for their own gains. Now, the challenges we've noticed, uh, you, you know, of course, generative AI uh, makes it easy to come up with disinformation. We've seen uh, how it is used to trick to trick people, including journalists, to share information on their platforms that have very shady origins. And I think also bad economies, inflation is on the rise. People are getting poorer. And this makes it easy for these formation networks to recruit members because they need money. And so AI makes it easy to spread, uh, to, to come up with this information, but poverty makes it easy to spread it because people are just willing to do anything. Uh, uh, I'll co conclude. I think Mark is uh, the vigorous head shaking is telling me to, to wrap up. I'll conclude by saying online disinformation leads to real life harm, that there's no doubt about this. And we need more collaborative efforts. We, we have at Human Angle partnered with Code for Africa. Uh, we've done some work also with the African Center. And this has helped us a lot to uh, look in the right direction to have access to tools that can help us in our reporting. I think newsrooms should collaborate with other newsrooms. Newsrooms should collaborate with researchers and tech companies and policymakers. And finally, we should look at this information more systematically and be more broad-minded and ambitious because actually the scale of the problem is huge when you take time to look at it. And so the only way to tackle it is also to have more systematic processes and solutions in place. Thank you. Thank you, Kunle. Um, I think you've hit on several very important points, including um, the under-moderation of African languages on a lot of these platforms and how um, we're not detecting and even seeing a lot of disinformation because of that tactic that these actors use. And also this point about um, 
you know, you, you highlighted a number of actors from militant groups to successionist groups to political actors to foreign actors. And I think that dynamic really defines a lot of the African information environments where there is this multiplicity of disinformation actors. And it's not just coming from one direction. It's, it's really multidimensional. Um, and that, I think, makes it all the more important to have um, country level journalists, community journalists who know the context, who knows knows what's happening. Um, oftentimes, unfortunately, we see international media, you know, inadvertently amplify some of these um, disinformation narratives because they're not in the country doing the reporting, talking to people. Um, and then your other point, I, I love this image of this hydra headed monster um, and how sometimes um, kind of traditional fact checking can just feel like chopping off one one little bit, but you know five more grow back. Um, and so then this need to think um, and connect these dots to these really what are disinformation machines um, and the need to use data to do that. So um, I think it's well time now that we'll talk to um, Vanessa next, um, whose team does just that. Um, and I'd like Vanessa, I'd like to ask you um, to discuss the research you're doing with Code for Africa um, to uncover and document disinformation campaigns and talk about some of the innovations and approaches you're taking and how you're leveraging technology um, and data for this work and some of the insights you're finding. Hello, merci Marc. Merci pour l'invitation et bonsoir à tout le monde. Je suis Vanessa Manesson de l'équipe AILAP de Côte for Africa. Alors, au tout, au tout début euh, d'un projet d'identification de campagne de désinformation, nous commençons par euh, mener des enquêtes. Les enquêtes peuvent être menées euh, en ligne et hors ligne. Donc, le but est de, de, de passer par des interviews, de rencontrer euh, des populations cibles sur euh, déjà les, les langages qu'ils utilisent pour communiquer sur un sujet précis. Donc, à l'issue de ces enquêtes, nous euh, présentons ou bien nous créons une base de données de lexique. Ces lexiques ensuite sont, en, en fait, les lexiques sont que des, des ensembles de mots-clés. Ces mots-clés euh, qui sont sauvegardés dans une base de données qui pourrait être aussi partagée avec d'autres organisations pour des besoins ultérieurs sont utilisés pour euh, créer des requêtes. Donc, nous travaillons euh, énormément avec euh, les outils technologiques. Ça peut être des outils euh, open source ou ça peut être à travers des, des notebooks. Donc, pour les outils open source, ça peut être des outils euh, peu connu comme beaucoup plus connu comme Mel WhatsApp, Grand Tank. Donc, les mots clés euh, récoltés nous permettent de générer des requêtes spécifiques. Donc, nous écrivons des requêtes qui sont ensuite introduites dans ces outils-là. Alors, maintenant, à partir euh, des outils, nous collectons un ensemble de publications ou bien de posts sur les plateformes sociales pour un contexte donné. Voilà. Maintenant, <coughs> lorsque nous avons euh, toutes euh, les publications, nous pouvons commencer notre analyse. Les outils que nous utilisons aussi, c'est les outils de cartographie. Par exemple, OpenCTI qui permet de cartographier les incidents ou des campagnes. Donc, et aussi euh, Airtable. Donc, ces outils sont très importants parce que euh, on les utilise également comme euh, des outils de sauvegarde et pouvait, pourrait être partagé ultérieurement avec d'autres organisations. Donc, dans le travail de Côte for Africa, nous, lorsque nous faisons des identifications des campagnes coordonnées, nous, nous avons rencontré très souvent des techniques, des tactiques et des procédures que les acteurs des campagnes utilisent très souvent. C'est vrai que Marc en a cité quelques, euh, certains de ces techniques parce que c'est pratiquement généralement les mêmes techniques que ces acteurs utilisent. Donc, nous avons par exemple des marionnettes africanistes généralement utilisées dans le cadre de la désinformation russe en Afrique. La migration vers des plateformes sombres telles que WhatsApp, Telegram, Bria, etc., donc, parce que aujourd'hui, euh, les plateformes telles que Facebook, Twitter, sévissent de plus en plus dès lors qu'on constate 
des cas de désinformation. Alors, des acteurs de la désinformation migrent progressivement, progressivement vers ces réseaux plus sécurisés. Et aussi, nous avons observé un cas de TTP assez euh, spécifique au cas des, 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 des groupes extrémistes, notamment le passage sous le radar qui consiste à utiliser des applications de, chiff de chiffrement plus petits. Donc, à travers... Euh, le Sahel, donc euh, ces acteurs-là partagent via ces pla des, des plateformes des messages violents en utilisant des, des applications telles que Shower, euh, Wearer ou Couplé à des plateformes décentralisées auto hébergées comme Matrix IO, Element IO et Rocket Chat. Donc nous avons également toujours pour ces extrémistes-là l'utilisation des noms de domaines qui comporte des espaces. Donc, ils partagent sur les plateformes euh, sociales des liens vers leurs plateformes, mais ils ajoutent des, des espaces dans les noms de domaine pour éviter que ces liens soient automatiquement détectés. Et aussi, ils changent très, rapide, très fréquemment les, les, les noms de domaine. Donc, cette opération, cette pratique garantit que même si un nom de domaine est compromis, le réseau s'adapte rapidement pour continuer ses opérations. Également, à part euh, ces tactiques utilisées généralement par les groupes extrémistes, nous avons l'utilisation des images et vidéos manipulées et parfois générées à partir des logiciels d'intelligence artificielle. De qui, mal, mal, euh, à cause du fait qu'ils sont de plus en plus sophistiqués, rendent difficile l'analyse de ces fichiers-là. Alors, aussi, euh, l'utilisation des groupes armés, de, des armés de robots. Les robots sont de plus en plus utilisés en Afrique, surtout dans le cadre des élections présidentielles, notamment c'est ce qui a été le cas euh, aux élections de, du Kenya en 2022. Donc, Côte Africa, pour déterminer cet ETP, adopte l'approche ABCD. Donc, premièrement, nous commençons par identifier les différents acteurs. Nous analysons les comportements, les types de contenu que euh, ces acteurs partagent. Et aussi, nous essayons de, de, de voir l'impact, le décret et l'impact d'une campagne de, de, de désinformation donnée. Alors, et aussi, nous avons pu élaborer ou bien... Euh, identifier l'impact sur euh, le, la gouvernance, la sécurité et aussi euh, sur les jeunes. Donc, nous avons constaté que la désinformation est utilisée pour éroder la confiance dans les institutions gouvernementales et les institutions indépendantes, surtout pendant les élections. La, dés la désinformation est utilisée pour polariser et diviser en capitalisant sur les problèmes sensibles qui divise la société, ce qui augmente les risques d'insécurité. Aujourd'hui, les jeunes de, de la plage d'âge 14 et 24 ans sont de, massivement présents sur les réseaux sociaux. Ils sont ainsi davantage exposés aux risques de désinformation. Ils présentent des cibles idéales pour le recrutement dans des groupes extrémistes via des campagnes de désinformation visant à attirer euh, des personnes vulnérables et à les radicaliser. Alors, ce que Côte d'Afrique a fait pour contrer la désinformation, nous exposons les acteurs malveillants et les infrastructures qui amplifient le contenu toxique. Et ceci, en cartographiant les réseaux d'acteurs, les marionnettistes derrière les contenus trompeurs. Également, les conclusions de nos recherches sont publiées sous forme de dossiers, de preuves pour des expositions médiatiques et des campagnes d'ONG de surveillance ainsi que euh, pour des actions par des plateformes de, régula de régulateurs. Voilà. Côte d'Afrique euh, offre euh, généralement euh, des bourses de formation continue aux journalistes leur permettant d'améliorer leur méthode d'investigation en utilisant les outils technologiques spécifiques. Également, nous formons des citoyens lambda à l'identification des opérations d'influence dans le cadre d'une campagne de désinformation. Car ici, euh, lorsque les jeunes sont directement impliqués, il faudrait qu'on puisse développer des stratégies pour euh, pouvoir directement former ces jeunes-là afin qu'ils pr prennent conscience du, du risque. Alors, pour aller plus loin, puisque Côte d'Afrique ne fait qu'une infime partie de ce qu'elle peut faire pour pouvoir euh, 
aider à lutter contre la désinformation. Nous pensons que, étant donné que la désinformation est une activité rentable, si nous pouvons faire en sorte de perturber l'économie de la désinformation, par exemple en augmentant les coûts, cela pourrait réduire considérablement considérablement le taux de désinformation. Aussi, en implémentant les CND euh, de la lutte contre la désinformation, qui est la démystification, la démantèle, euh, démantèlement, et la déplat, euh, le fait de déplatformer, de démontiser et aussi de dissuader. Alors, oui, et aussi un dernier point, parce que c'est souvent négligé, financer et renforcer les capacités des organisations de la société civile autochtone pour leur permettre de vérifier les faits et de surveiller la désinformation. Alors, donc, merci, Marc. Ça, c'est tout ce que je peux, je peux dire. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, and I appreciate you highlighting um, how Code for Africa has really honed in and focused on these TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that disinformation actors are using. Um, and while we want to know what they're saying, we want to know the narratives, the conspiracies, we really want to understand how they're manipulating these spaces. Um, and that's where you'll be able to combat them better. Um, and um, so for our audience, um, like all the, the organizations you're hearing from, I really encourage you to follow the work um, that Code for Africa is doing. Um, they're doing some very innovative, um, very cutting edge work to unmask disinformation campaigns and have a lot of good um, information available for you to, to, to access. Um, and finally, thank you for your, your patience, Harriet. Um, but I invite you now to tell us about the work that Pen Plus Bytes is doing in Ghana, in West Africa. Um, and I would note that Pen Plus Bytes is not um, at all a newcomer to these questions, but it's really built up this body of expertise of practical experiences over many years as a trusted um, organization in Ghana, helping to navigate the interaction between technology, society, and governance. Um, and so Harriet, I would be very curious to hear from you how you all are drawing on this legacy, this expertise to help democracies like Ghana defeat disinformation today. Thank you, Mark, for the opportunity. And yes, you are absolutely right. Pen Plus Byte is not new to this um, area. Uh, we have garnered significant experience over the past couple of years, and 2024 would be a set year. And so to answer your question, um, how do we leverage this legacy? I would say we do it um, in two approaches. The first is to um, expose the problem. Then the second is to empower the people. Because um, on, on, the, on the scale of exposing the problem, we believe that we cannot um, empower people if we have not first let them know that there is indeed a problem that they need to find solutions to. And so we organize um, public awareness campaigns just so they are able to be aware that they stand a risk of falling prey to um, disinformation and false information. However, aside from that, um, it doesn't end there because if you tell people that there is a problem, you have not actually helped them to navigate um, effectively around the problem. And so we, we have the empowering um, um, our audiences. Uh, that is where our media and information literacy initiatives come in. And so with this, we, um, train journalists, educators, and essentially just the ordinary citizens on skills that they can use to effectively navigate the digital spaces, critically um, evaluate content that they find online and identify false information and verify information. Now, upon our experience within the context of the geography that we find ourselves in, that is um, Ghana and West Africa has helped us to understand the cultural nuances and the language um, barriers, the level of education, um, and other variables that help us to shape our interventions and in initiatives to address specific people. Of course, we do not do this alone. We have over the years worked with like-minded organizations like 
UNESCO, um, DW Academy, the Ghana Commission for UNESCO, and other um, civil society organizations, all in a bit to um, effectively um, equip people with the, the tools, the skills that they need to navigate the digital spaces effectively. Now, it is said that disinformation is like a disease that is not going away anytime soon. It keeps evolving, for which reason that it is very important that um, we vaccinate ourselves. We ensure that everybody that um, we encounter is able to vaccinate themselves against the problem so that in the events that they come across false information, they are able to um, actually identify them and navigate their way around it effectively. So some of the specific initiatives that we have embarked on include a film series that um, we produced in collaboration with a local um, film production organization like um, the title is Rumors and it can be found on YouTube. We've also organized markets road shows where we provided um, MIL education for the general public, school tours where we provided MIL ed education for students, mostly comprising the youth, um, we've also organized MIO trainings for differently abled people. And so for now, the people, the differently abled people that we have able to, we have been able to reach are the deaf. And we have plans of doing that for more um, differently abled people. We've also produced or created online sources like the MIO Hub, which is a repository of MIO knowledge. When you go online, you can find it. Uh, we also organize um, uh, uh, social media campaigns like the Think Critically Click Wisely social media campaign um, just to educate the youth uh, about misinformation, disinformation, and the importance of um, navigating the media spaces more effectively and thinking critically anytime they come across information before they share. We've also uh, organized video production workshops and manuals, all in a bit to equip people with skills to um, become more media information lit literate. This is not an exhaustive list. We have done a couple of other things, but yes, you can find them on our website. Now, we've also engaged in research and reports on related topics, most of which can be found on our website. For example, we have... Um, the research on fake news, which we did in 2018. We are currently working on a research on disinformation in West Africa, and very soon it's going to be published, and every, everybody will be able to access it. And amongst others, that can also be found on our website. Now, from time to time, we are engaged by um, policymakers and stakeholders to discuss effective ways of um, combating disinformation um, on the landscape. And so, for instance, just last year, we were invited by the Ministry of Information to participate in the workshop and um, to uh, think about ways, deliberate on ways or strategies to increase MIL um, in Ghana. We've made significant impact with our initiatives. Um, firstly, I would say we've had a wide reach because looking at the number of um, initiatives that we have embarked on. Uh, lots of people have directly and indirectly participated. When I say directly as an in-person and indirectly, those are the people who have been able to join us online. And so, so far we have reached more than 2,000 people directly and indirectly we have reached more than 15,000 people. We've also enhanced the MIL skills of the youth. And so 87% of people that we have engaged in the past with our training have um, uh, admitted or confirmed that they have now, they have had an increase in knowledge in uh, media and information literacy. And now our MIL um, trainees have become multipliers in their communities. And so after receiving the training that we give them, they go into their communities and then they train others in their community. And so this is gradually having a ripple effect. And now uh, looking at previously, before our initiative started, the interest in media information literacy was quite low, but um, after all these years, there has been an increase in interest in media information literacy um, on the landscape. 
Now, like my colleague Huile mentioned, to, to win this war against um, disinformation, it is important that researchers, academia, um, journalists, the media, and civil society organizations work hand in hand to be able to support each other and, and help eventually um, equip people to effectively navigate the digital spaces and combat disinformation on the landscape. I think I will end it here and wait for questions. Thank you, Harriet. Um, everything you all are doing with Pen Plus Spice is incredibly inspiring. Um, and I like this, this metaphor that you brought up of disinformation as a disease that's not going away. Um, and like a disease, um, you know, we can't just look at it in one point in time. We need to treat it holistically. We need to have um, prophylactics. We need to have some kind of vaccine pre-bunking, um, preparing for incidents where there will be disinformation. When the, there's an outbreak, we need to have rapid reaction um, responses. We need to have content moderation. Um, we need to have people speaking up. And then, you know, as there's recovery, there needs to be um, therapies, other treatments as we go on. So. Um, I think that's a way we can help think about, um, you know, this as kind of a, a process that's that's not going away um, for fighting disinformation. And I think as all of our panelists have laid out, we're really starting to grasp and appreciate um, kind of this sprawling nature of the the disinformation problem. Um, and if I was to briefly summarize what our speakers have shared, um, what I'd say is that we're learning that we need one evidence, two education, and three empowerment, um, especially of young people in order to fight back against these disinformation actors. We need evidence, we need this data empiricism to know what's happening, um, how disinformation actors are distorting um, the emerging digital spaces that young people rely on for information. We need to educate people about this problem into the realities of navigating these, these lies and manipulations. And then we need to empower people to find good information, to set up guardrails, um, and to lobby social media companies and policymakers. Um, and these, these efforts really have to be um, kind of organic from the ground up, led by um, citizens, owned by citizens, um, to build this agency, um, this, um, this resilience that, you know, from other case studies, from other places, um, we've learned that are much more effective, much more sustainable, much more successful um, when there is um, ownership by the people who, whose information spaces these are. So that... Um, now I'd like to um, transition to the Q&A section of today's webinar. Um, and if you'll indulge me as the moderator, um, I, I'd be really curious to hear our panels um, share some of the resources, some of the tools, some of the websites they use um, in their professional, in their daily life um, for fact checking, for finding good information, for helping them figure out fact from fiction. Um, I don't think I've had a chance to ask you this um, directly in our, our previous engagement. So I'd be really curious um, if just in a few minutes, each of our panelists could walk us through some of um, the tools that that they use um, to navigate their their information world. Um, so maybe we could just go in the same order as, as the panel. So Edmund, please. So at the KIPTC, uh, two will be training and research. So through our research, we are able to know the scope of the effects, the scope of the disinformation campaign, and we're able to report on them. All our training programs are research-backed. So based on our research findings, we are able to um, make inputs in our training curriculum so that people who go through our training are empowered to fight disinformation, for the lack of a better word, fight disinformation, deal with disinformation, and be able to identify them and know how to deal with them. Um, we have also started public engagements, again, like this one, 
where we intend to maximize our impact, reach a larger number of people, go beyond the experts that we've been engaging, go beyond the practitioners that we've been engaging to the general public, so that through these engagements, we'll be able to um, inoculate um, the populace against the effects of disinformation. Okay, um, well, at Kimal Angu, I think one, one tool we found really essential is Crowd Tango because it helps us to, of course, Facebook is the social media platform that has likely the largest uh, active users in this part of the world. And Crowd Tango helps to easily find instances of coordinated amplification on Facebook, as well as instances of um, posts that are trending. Uh, of course, sometimes we, we know that the algorithm emphasizes outrageous posts or pushes outrageous posts and some of these outrageous posts uh, have a foundation of disinformation, so that helps a lot. And through our partnership with Code for Africa, we are able to get occasional access to mail Twitter, which achieves similar results, especially for Twitter. And um, of course, the good old spreadsheet and Excel cannot be overemphasized. We also use visualization tools to simplify data, uh, Flourish, Data Wrapper, Canva, etc. And then uh, absolutely reverse image search tools as well. I think RevEye is, can be critical uh, because it gives you multiple options. Finally, there's what we know as Media Cloud, which is a tool that was developed by Code for Africa. I, I, I probably am not in the best position to talk about this. I'm hoping uh, uh, the other panelists from Code for Africa would do justice to that. Alors, comme outil de fact checking uh, à Code for Africa, uh, c'est vrai que nous avons d'abord une équipe uh, de vérification de faits, mais généralement aussi, parce que lorsqu'on parle de vérification de faits, ça peut être déjà la vérification d'une information. Parfois, c'est aussi, uh, ça vise aussi à l'authentification uh, de, de, de certaines images publiées sur uh, les réseaux. Donc, déjà, s'il si s'agit, parce que parfois les informations sont publiées, mais avec des illustrations, euh, des images compromettantes qui euh, n'ont pas été prises dans ce contexte-là. Voilà. Donc, le processus de fact-checking peut aussi euh, déjà euh, impliquer la vérification de l'authenticité de, de l'image. Alors, il peut arriver que l'image soit authentique, mais qu'elle ne soit pas pour ce contexte-là. Voilà. Pour cela, nous utilisons euh, les outils comme euh, le Fact Check Explorer, aussi les ressources, les outils euh, de Google Reverse State. Euh, vous voyez, Remas, euh, Reverse Image. Donc, il suffit de, de, de sélectionner une image pour pouvoir voir euh, quand est-ce que euh, l'image a déjà été utilisée. Donc, parfois, on peut voir que l'image a été utilisée pour la première fois il y a 10 ans. Et maintenant, nous parlons d'un événement qui est, qui est arrivé aujourd'hui. Donc, ça, porte, ça veut déjà dire que l'événement n'est pas véridique. Voilà. Et aussi, euh, on peut procéder à l'analyse des métadétats, de, que ce soit de la vidéo ou de l'image. Donc, ce sont des informations que comportent des fichiers qu'on transfère sur Internet. Can I go now, Mark? Please, ever you hear it. Okay, so um, for Pen Glassbyte, right, what normally informs our initiatives um, are research. We do research to um, understand the um, ecosystem and so uh, the channels, the access of certain um, things that we want to um, um, engage people on. And then secondly, we, we have um, experts interviews. So we interview experts in the field just so to understand um, where they, their opinion on things and how best to approach on certain things. And just last year, um, that, was, you know, that was 2022 instead, and we conducted um, a gap analysis, if I could put it that way, of the um, initiatives that we have embarked on from 2019 to 2021. And so looking at the uh, initiatives within this um, period, we were able to identify certain things, certain people that we have not been able to reach, certain things that still need to be done to be able to um, 
uh, engage more people, have more impact in Ghana. And so for us, that is what we normally do. But from time to time, when we encounter certain things that we are not so sure about, yes, we go on um, Google, try and verify from other reliable news sources to make sure that they are also um, sharing the same information, whether they are also reporting in the same way. Um, yes, so for PEMPLAS bytes, that is what I can say. Thank you all. Um, some really practical and useful um, resources there for, for our audience, uh, many of which are um, open source and accessible. Um, it can be part of um, kind of our online habits as we uh, wade through um, you know, reading the news um, or, or going on social media. Um, so we have a number of other comments in the, the chat. Um, and one question that's come up um, a few times um, and is one I'd be very curious to hear all our panelists reflect on is, in addition to knowing that disinformation um, can thrive during moments of crises, um, during fast moving um, events, we also see a connection between um, the impact of disinformation, its ability to thread and confuse people um, in more closed information environments. Um, countries where journalism cannot be practiced freely, where there's not press freedoms, um, where um, there might be just one national broadcaster or one state newspaper. Um, so we, we have heard and we've seen that um, fighting disinformation can be an uphill battle in um, democracies where there is, um, you know, at least in theory, um, freedom of, of expression, freedom of information. So what about um, in your experience or talking to colleagues, what are some of the steps that people can take or what are, or um, you know, potentially working with um, international organizations to um, start to address disinformation in some of these more closed contexts? Um, and I think we could just go in the, the same order again. Okay. So First of all, the very tools for um, disinformation in a free society can be the tools for combating disinformation in a restricted society. So normally there are gaps in the restrictions that you can exploit. They might close um, regular news outlets, but social media might be open. They might um, close particular social media outlets, but others might be open. So it is context specific. Based on the context and based on the nature of the restrictions, you might have to exploit gaps within these restrictions. Sometimes if they restrict, um, let's say it's only one state broadcaster, social media might be open and you might try to get your news from that angle. So, those are some of the things that you can look at. You can also look at academic journals and all of that. Sometimes people have their news from academia, though that normally comes so belated and it's not so current because of the fact checking that goes on in academia. But that might be a very credible source of receiving credible information. So you might have to exploit based on your context, the gaps that exist in the restriction. Thank you. I think that's that's a really uh, brilliant question and something that everybody needs to start thinking about. I think one way to address the issue would be to promote advocacy and activism on the subject. We need, of course, uh, to understand that digital rights are universal and should be an inalienable human right. Uh, access to the internet should not be something that would be negotiated in any country. Freedom of information, every country should have passed the Freedom of Information Act uh, by now. And I think these are things that we can have on the international stage. Uh, and, and you mentioned how international organizations of countries can be brought in. And so if we all recognize and acknowledge how crucial these human rights are and uh, these accesses, then it's, we can start having conversations about, hey, if you want some grants, if you want some aid, if you want some partnership, these are the conditions, these are the frameworks that you need to have instituted in your country before 
you know, you can have access to these opportunities on the international scene. And so some level of sanction, some level of restriction of access to opportunities, uh, tying, tying them to this digital rights. And then we should also maybe encourage, like uh, Edmund said, that there are always backdoors to some of these things. People can be taught how to use VPN tools. Uh, people can be taught how to set up online videos if the government is jamming frequencies locally. Uh, we can start talking about how to empower citizens of the country in the diaspora to also report on the issues that they are familiar with and they are protected you know, uh, in, from backlash when they report on those issues. And you know, having training sessions for journalists on operating in hostile environments. I, I for example, been reporting in Sudan, uh, came to limelight when you know, the crisis was very hot and they took some measures to also protect their workers by some, uh, for example, not publishing their bylines, uh, not sharing their office address, uh, et cetera. So these are also strategies that we can teach journalists in some of these countries to also protect themselves. And of course, a lot can also happen off offline. People can meet offline, discuss the issues. Fact checkers can share the tr what is actually happening with people offline, have ambassadors who can also spread or disseminate information in ways that can evade detection. Alors. Et euh, sur la question de la stratégie pour utiliser, pour avoir des sources de données plus fermement, c'est toujours mieux de, de je l'a dit, euh, entre aussi, pour être sûr que son une information est fiable, toujours aller à la source. Donc, si vous voulez une information euh, concernant une, euh, une organisation spécifique, c'est toujours mieux d'aller sur les plateformes de communication sur, euh, de ces organisations. Sorry, Vanessa, we, we had a little bit of trouble hearing you there. Um, I think we got the gist of it. Um, I think, um, we can come back to you if you have more to add, but um, let's go to Harriet in the meantime. Yeah, so what I would first say is that there's the need for, there's the need for um, building awareness and um, capacity for people about their digital rights so that they, they they do not fall prey or they do not they are not so limited when it comes to these things and also i would want to say that to address effectively the problem we should go to the root cause of the problem and in in africa or in fact research has found that um some uh, it, some problems that lead to um, the spread of disinformation, especially among the youth, uh, uh, in um, inequalities in the countries, poverty, unemployment rates, high un unemployment rates, and so when these things are rife, most people do not feel the need or do not have any reason to um, combat or fight against false information because yes, they are getting just uh, some money to um, spread false information, money that originally they do not have. And so if we're able to go to the root cause of the problem, I believe that we will not actually be having this kind of conversation right now. But in the, in the effects, in the events that we, um, we do not um, address this at the roots, we can, we can consider building awareness and capacity uh, building uh, initiatives for people to know more about their digital rights. Thank you, Harriet. Um, relatedly, uh, questions come up um, about the use of um, internet blackouts or cutting the internet as a way of, you know, trying to calm a situation or, um, you know, curb disinformation. So. Um, I have my own uh, trepidations about that. And, you know, thinking about this connection between closed 
um, information spaces and the proliferation of disinformation. But I would ask if if any of our panelists want to jump in on that question and respond. Um, I guess the, someone in the chat is mentioning that in the aftermath of the election in Comoros, the internet has been cut there. Well, the the I think the important thing is number one that we do not normalize such actions. Uh, We've seen so many instances of that happening, internet shutdowns across Africa. And I think it's especially spiked in the last two to three years. And so we shouldn't see them as, oh, it's just another African dictator doing, uh, using the regular tactic. We, there should be uh, international opera whenever that happens, such that at least they would have second thoughts when they consider that we, it should not, be something that we would see as, uh, you know, just another day in, you know, some part of Africa. And then it's also a technological problem if, I mean, with the invention of Starlinks, hopefully if more parts of regions of the continent have access to technology like that and it becomes more affordable for the average person, it can help to uh, bypass some of these, um, I mean, technical hurdles. And finally, like I said earlier, the rights to internet, the rights to have access to internet should be something that is permanent, should be something that everybody can lay claim to. And so we should continue to advocate for this, whether or not shutdowns uh, have happened, and we should continue to name and shame regimes that adopt these approaches. Thanks, Kunle. Um, okay, very well, well put. And um, Edmund, I'd like to turn to you. There's a question in the chat. Um, someone's picking up on the fact that you mentioned that um, you know, approximately two thirds of detected and documented disinformation campaigns um, are external, are, are coming from countries' um, origins outside of the continent. And this um, participant is asking if um, there are strategies that African countries can take to try and defend against those kind of um, disinformation attacks. Okay, so first of all, full disclosure, this comes from you, Mark. <laughs> this comes from your article. Um, the, the, there are ways to deal with this, but first of all, we need to um, observe that most of the external manipulation of information occurs in, they don't, it doesn't occur in vacuum. They try to exploit existing divisions. They try to exploit um, tensions that are already brewing and then they exacerbate it. They try to exaggerate wrong things that are already happening. So if say five people have been killed, the exaggeration is that 10 people have been killed. They seldom happen in a vacuum and then in some cases, they have willing partners internally, either with the opposition or with a faction or with a ruling government. So we need to understand how the external activities occur in order to identify how to deal with them. To deal with these external, uh, externally generated disinformation campaigns, we will need to cut it from the source starting from an informed populace, starting from who benefits from that campaign. Let the people know who ends up benefiting. Let the people know some of the economic advantages that those who end up benefiting will get to get. And it does not take, some people think you need to disinform to uh, fight this information. I've heard of that tactic, but no, you use pure facts because you cannot, fight evil with evil. You use the facts to fight it. And the people must just know, like Kunle said, the people have a right to know, but we need to identify what they are exploiting. So long as there are divisions, so long as there are factions, the external parties will exploit it for their gain. We need to close ranks to be able to ward them off. Thanks. Thank you, Edmund. Um, would any of our other speakers like to come in on this question? Yes, um, like I said in the beginning, the analogy I made about um, 
disinformation or false information being like a disease, um, for which reason we need to vaccinate um, ourselves um, against it. Um, and like Mark, you rightly mentioned, to, to, to serve as a sort of um, pre-banking mechanism or strategy. I believe that if everybody receives this vaccination, then they are able to identify false information when they come across it, and then they will not fall prey to the intentions behind them. When they come across such suspicious content, at least if for nothing at all, they will be able to question the intention behind it. And it is likely that there will be um, less people who will fall prey to such um, false um, uh, information narratives. Thank you, Harriet. Um, Vanessa, did you have anything to add on this, this question? Uh, alors, Marc, uh, je n'ai pas très bien suivi la question de départ parce que ma communication était un peu instable. Okay, sorry about that. Um, just to briefly um, repeat it, it's, the question was, um, are there strategies that countries and civil society can take um, to defend against specifically um, foreign-backed disinformation targeting their, their countries? Alors, oh, d'accord. Merci, Marc. Alors, déjà, euh, si la, dé la désinformation est externe à un pays, ça veut dire que c'est déjà euh, du point de vue du gouvernement que la question doit être prise en considération et qu'ensemble avec euh, les, les, le gouvernement et aussi les journalistes qui sont des acteurs euh, euh, sur le terrain de l'information, ensemble réfléchir sur la, la solution adéquate pour pouvoir euh, lutter contre la désinformation venant des pays externes. There's a question that um, somebody's asking about, you know, uh, hypothetical, but I think that this is could easily become a reality, um, and we've seen this with some of the um, cyber uh, communication laws that countries have passed. Um, you know, if your your country is, if the the policymakers are considering a law around disinformation, um, what are some of the guidance you might give? What are some of the um, you know the pitfalls that that could be um, in that type of legislation? Um, you know, with the the cybersecurity laws, we've seen that sometimes. Um, where those laws have been used to target um, journalists or opposition members um, under kind of uh, the, um, you know, claim that it's, it's defending cybersecurity. So how can we avoid something similar happening with disinformation where it's used to, you know, there's this trend where um, if somebody doesn't like what somebody says, they call it fake news or they call it disinformation. Um, so how can we stop that from being enshrined in law and maybe think more thoughtfully about the kinds of policies um, that we would want um, African governments to um, potentially legislate around this issue. First of all, fake news can threaten the freedom of the press and threaten democracy. Um, in as much as we want a liberal press, in as much as we want everybody to have a right to information, we are also careful about this information. Now, when we try to fight disinformation, we're also careful about stifling freedom. So there's a delicate balance that we must, we must uh, be able to navigate and we must look at the context. Sometimes we also need to look at effects. Can policymakers start by considering not making, um, not lumping disinformation with misinformation? There are honest mistakes that can be made. Can we treat them as civil offenses instead of criminal offenses? Can we strengthen the judicial mechanisms such that it is not just because someone claimed something, action is taken against the perceived offender. Those are things that we need to factor in whenever we are making laws, whenever we are making policies. What are the mechanisms to verify that there was indeed disinformation? How credible are those mechanisms? 
how aligned or not aligned are those mechanisms that we have put in place. If we put in place watchdogs that are aligned to the ruling party, then all opposition publications can be branded disinformation. Um, people who want to speak, and if it happened to be against those in power, they might have to walk on eggshells just because they cannot make a mistake. We need to distinguish what is an honest mistake and what is criminally intentioned to cause harm or to gain profit or to foment trouble or to, to stoke tensions within communities. If these policies are unable to distinguish these, then we are getting into dangerous waters trying to legislate against this information. Uh, well, that's, that's an absolutely brilliant response from Edmond, distinguishing between civil and criminal cases and intended disinformation and innocent instances. What I just want to add is the, the problem usually is that a lot of these governments and administrations have a history of uh, clamping down on this freedom of expression and they've used these laws to you know, infringe on the rights of journalists to operate and press freedom. And so even when the intentions are innocent, we do not trust them to implement them fairly. And I mean, so the governments need to start by establishing a track record of trustworthiness uh, and adherence to fundamental human rights. And then I think it should also we also realize that existing laws usually are co comprehensive enough to tackle cases of disinformation and harmful uh, communication on social media. So you can just implement laws that are already in place uh, without having to uh, legislate uh, fresh laws. And then the government should focus on empowering journalists and collaborating with tech companies. A lot of these tech companies have windows where governments can uh, lodge complaints to bring down posts that violate, you know, policy and legal frameworks. So they should do more of that rather than uh, trying to lock people up in prisons for many years because of what they see online. It's a very, like Edmond said, there's a very delicate balance. Alors, de mon côté, euh, déjà, lorsqu'on parle de désinformation, euh, je voudrais déjà euh, considérer ces où est-ce que ça se passe, sur quelle plateforme ça se passe, parce que euh, déjà, pour contribuer euh, à la lutte contre la désinformation à travers les réseaux sociaux. Lorsque nous sommes sur les réseaux sociaux, déjà être à mesure euh, de pouvoir identifier si euh, nous trouvons une publication que l'on juge être euh, une désinformation, nous devons trouver des moyens de signaler cela. Maintenant, sur le, le, le plan du gouvernement, je pense que les, le, les différents gouvernements africains devraient euh, développer des systèmes de de cartographie, de, de désinformation et aussi des acteurs. Donc, si par exemple, je suis sur un réseau social ou bien sur un site web, parce que sur les réseaux sociaux, même si je, je signale une publication, je peux donner une description de pourquoi est-ce que je signale la publication. Maintenant, si c'est sur une plateforme web, comment est-ce que je fais pour mettre le gouvernement au courant de, de ce que tel site web euh, diffuse comme information Voilà. Donc, en mettant sur pied un système comme ça, où chaque fois que l'on découvre euh, des, des blogs, euh, des journalistes, même parce qu'il y a des journalistes qui font de la désinformation, on renseigne euh, et le nom de l'auteur et ainsi de suite. Donc, avec le temps, on pourra mieux cartographier cela. Et en fonction, le gouvernement peut, pourrait prendre des mesures. Parce que ça, c'est quelque chose que c'est vrai, le gouvernement ne peut pas seul le faire. Ça sera toujours avec les professionnels du métier. Okay, so for me, I believe um, one strategy that we can take would be to demand accountability for from um, people who share content online. And so if we are able to, or if the government is able to get people to be responsible for the content that they share online, I believe that they will be more careful about the things that they put out there because at the end of the day, they are going to be questioned if was false information and if it had negative intentions behind them. 
thank you all. Um, and, and those are incredibly thoughtful and helpful responses. And I'd, I'd like to pose kind of um, the inverse. If there's concerns about heavy handedness in legislation and government kind of overreaction um, on this question of disinformation, you know, what are some of the ways that um, government, um, the international community, can support the work that counter disinformation practitioners are doing in Africa? What are some of the partnerships you would like to see um, with public universities, with um, you know government agencies, you know government uh, public affairs or strategic communication? Or are we not at a point in a lot of countries where something like that is feasible or um, you know optimal? Um, I uh, welcome anyone who wants to come in and, and reflect on this. Some. Uh, Kind of partnerships and support you would like to see for the work you and your peers are doing? So for me, I would say um, international organizations can fund trainings for um, entities in our country that are seeking to um, combat disinformation, that are taking up different, different various initiatives to equip people with skills um, to effectively um, combat disinformation and navigate safely around them. I also believe in mentorships. Um, I believe that if these in international organizations are able to um, place um, certain individuals who have strong interest in fighting against disinformation, in learning more about ways, creative ways of helping to combat disinformation, maybe, let's say maybe a year mentorship, two years mentorship, then these people will then come back into their countries and then um, impact the, the, the disinformation landscape within their countries. Also, I believe that um, international organizations can fund research because it, it takes quite a, a lot to um, do intensive research, impactful research. And so if these international organizations can do that, that would be very helpful. And finally, for civil society organizations like mine, I believe that um, support in terms of funding and equipment will also go a long way because one of the key things that civil society organizations do is um, grassroots um, engagement, going into various communities, engaging people, teaching them um, ways about ways to um, navigate um, disinformation, the disinformation landscape. And so I believe that if these international organizations can take these steps, it, it could go a, a long way to help in the fight against disinformation. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Mark, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned public universities. And I think through uh, encouragement from governments, there's a lot that journalists can do which researchers in, uh, you know, departments of mass communication or disinformation, if any such exists, uh, because it takes time to analyze these issues. And I think the people with probably all the time in the world are those in uh, institutions like that. So if the government would make grants available for, uh, partnerships and collaborations between newsrooms and universities, that, that would be brilliant. If the government is also able to maybe fund access to some of these tools that journalists use, because I mean, asking for money directly might bring up ethical uh, challenges, but if the government just says, hey, we are paying for access to Meltwater for 10 years for uh, reputable newsrooms, that, that would be fantastic. Uh, intelligence, you mentioned when you talked about foreign influence, one of the thought I had was, you know, sometimes we can see that clearly these actors are being paid by these people to do what they are doing because no other motivation makes sense, but we do not have ways to prove it. And the, the only way to get such information would sometimes be by working with the government to, you know, trace um, some of the cash flow with uh, trying as much as possible not to also infringe on people's rights to privacy, but it would be helpful if you can establish that kind of funding between these networks, and then you can be transparent about it such that when they now publish information that is false or misleading, we can let the public know 
through collaboration with social media giants that, hey, this information is biased or the person sharing this information with you has so and so bias because they receive, they've been shown to receive funding from so and so groups and, and all that. And I think a co coalition of governments can also learn a lot from the European Union by forcing uh, tech companies to make certain compromises or accommodations in, in how they treat data. For example, if people are targeting, if ads are targeting audiences in the EU now, you can easily tell from the ad library. Uh, it would be nice to have something like that for Africa as well. So if you find ads that are targeting specific groups of people or age brackets on the continent, that tech giants are also compelled to be transparent with that information. Finally, governments should just leave journalists alone. If you cannot help us, at least do not come after us. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'll start from the last but one point Conley raised, um, an intergovernmental approach. With the intergovernmental approach, we are able to make this information the exception instead of the norm in African countries. I think most in most countries, they get away with it because it has become the norm. So if country A does it and it's happening in country B, when it happens in country C, you don't have much to complain about because for the leaders among their peers, that is the norm. So when we have an intergovernmental commitment to combating disinformation, then we can help make it the exception in the countries that they occur instead of it becoming the norm in Africa. In terms of the interactions beyond the government to government um, interaction and partnership, we are looking at an organization like the Kofianan International Peacekeeping Training Center in the coming years looks to step up research training and engagements on the issue of disinformation. And we are looking to work with our partners at the African Center, Africa Center to get this done. We are also looking to civil society organizations like that's um, the one of um, Mesofori and other, and working on developing training programs for journalists. I think Kunle mentioned that um, hostile environments training and all of that will need to be. And we do hostile environment training here at the Kofiana International Peacekeeping Training Center. I think um, the training department will work on developing one tailor made for journalists, developing one tailor made for people who are in search of information such that they may be able to take care of themselves. But I think we should approach it also from the research and policy angle, and then we can be able to have a holistic approach to this matter. Thanks. Alors, comme je l'ai mentionné tout à l'heure, Côte pour Africa a bien euh, conscience du, du fait que des petites organisations qui font euh, dans la lutte contre la désinformation ont besoin de support. C'est généralement aussi pourquoi est-ce que nous travaillons avec euh, ces organisations-là, notamment euh, en RDC lors de du projet de lutte contre la désinformation euh, en RDC euh, durant l'année 2023. Nous avons collaboré avec les partenaires tels que Congo Tchèque. Et aussi, nous avons euh, offert beaucoup de bourses de formation des journalistes et aussi euh, des citoyens africains, que ce soit d'Afrique anglophone ou francophone, parce qu'il y a toujours ce souci de formation, d'accompagnement, parce que c'est très important. Et aussi, et aussi, Marc, je, je vais ajouter aussi euh, le volet de la population autochtone qui est souvent euh, assez négligée. Donc, euh, comme je l'ai dit, il faudrait que euh, l'on puisse trouver des moyens de, 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 de financer et, et de renforcer leurs capacités. Parce que c'est vrai que à côte fort Africa, nous faisons beaucoup de formations, mais nos formations sont en ligne parce que pour aller dans les villages, il faudrait bien se déplacer. Donc, ça, c'est un problème qui reste toujours d'actualité. Thanks, Vanessa. And um, that's actually what I wanted to, to pick up next um, was, you know, we've laid out all these tools, strategies, resources, um, and I think there's there's a wealth of um, you know capacity there. But um, as some people are bringing up in the chat, you know, how do we get some of these uh, resources to um, offline communities? You know, 
in a country like Niger, only about 20% of the country is online. So fact checking on a digital platform isn't a lot of use to a lot of people, even if the disinformation, you know, is going from WhatsApp and then being read or spread through a community. So what other um, offline um, strategies are there? And then you, this also has kind of a, a gender dynamic to it. We know that a lot of African online spaces um, are predominantly um, dominated by, by men, um, where you know, oftentimes it's 60, 70 percent of um, men who have an internet connection because of some of the um, socioeconomic dynamics in, in countries. So how do we empower um, and get these uh, tools and skills to more women, um, to more uh, offline communities, and also to in other African languages um, to people who don't um, use the internet in um, English or French. Maybe um, Vanessa, did you want to come back in on that, or I welcome anyone else to to go ahead and jump in. Oui, Marc, je veux commencer par le volet qui concerne l'accès à Internet. C'est vrai que c'est un vrai challenge parce que les zones où euh, il n'y a pas accès à Internet, l'information continue de circuler et c'est celui qui vient euh, transmettre l'information, qui est maître de l'information et les autres n'ont aucun moyen de vérifier cela. Alors, je pense que euh, aujourd'hui, des solutions sont en train d'être développées. Euh, nous, nous avons notamment euh, rencontré un jeune homme de la Côte d'Ivoire lors de l'atelier organisé par Africa Center à Dakar. Euh, lui, euh, son projet vise à euh, transmettre des informations à travers euh, des, euh, des, des systèmes de messagerie et sans connexion à Internet. Donc, si l'on peut davantage développer ce type de solution, ça pourrait vraiment être euh, un soulagement pour ces populations-là n'ayant pas accès à Internet. Et maintenant, OK, et en, en ce qui concerne en ce qui concerne l'accès à Internet par les femmes, ce n'est pas déjà pas euh, l'alphabétisation des, des femmes, l'automisation des femmes, parce que, comme vous l'avez bien dit, euh, les hommes, eux, ils ont accès à Internet, c'est parfois dû à leur activité, parce que ils, sont, euh, ils travaillent, ils ont besoin d'Internet pour faire autre chose. Et si une femme déjà ne fait pas euh, des occupations qui lui obligent d'utiliser Internet, c'est assez compliqué que du jour au lendemain, elle se mette sur Internet. Donc, il faudrait d'abord qu'on puisse déjà voir euh, le programme d'alphabétisation et aussi d'autonomisation des femmes. Thanks, Vanessa. Those are great, great examples. Um, it looks like Harriet and Edmund both want to come in. Yes, I also think that leveraging the traditional media in these um, local communities would be helpful. So, for instance, you have the radios and then tele television, at least, especially for the women who um, do not have to go to work. They are mostly at home. And so, if they are at home, it's either they are listening to the radio or they are watching the television. So this would be a good platform to um, educate them on um, these issues. Also, especially in Ghana, I don't know about other African countries, the uh, community information centers in, uh, over there. So it, it's also just like the traditional media, an opportunity, a, a way that um, uh, information education about uh, media information literacy disinformation can be spread to the entire community and so for everyone who is within the community at that moment in time when that information is shared they receive that education they they, they learn something also um in these communities when someone who is assumed to be more learned or who is assumed to um, have more information comes to share information uh, with um, people who do not own these digital devices, I would suggest that whoever is engaging them would advise them to um, ask follow-up questions. Uh, very, very often, when people do not have um, 
all the details about something or what when the information that they are trying to share is false, they do not have all the details. And so when you ask follow-up questions, you realize that at a point they, they are found one thing. And so you yourself, you begin to wonder if indeed what the, the information that this person is trying to give you is actually true. And finally, um, in-person engagement, it, it's true, it's sometimes it's difficult to travel to these um, villages, these offline communities. However, and when the resources are available, experts can go to these um, um, communities and engage them one-on-one, -on -one, provide them with these education, uh, media information literacy, make them aware about false information. And I believe that this will also go a long way in help. It seems uh, Harriet read my mind, and that's why she had to go first and took all my points in the exact order that I had listed them. So again, radio and all of that. I think the only addition I will make, since she has listed all of them, will be that we need to have a community-based means of verification. Every community needs to have their way of verifying news. So whether they received it by radio or they received it through the information centers, they need to have a means of verification. That means whoever is at the information center must be a vetted person such that his credibility cannot be impugned. Um, Harriet is talking about the people asking questions, but most of these modalities don't give room for question and answers. If you hear it from the radio, you cannot call in to ask. If you hear it on the information center, you were on your way to the farm and you heard it, and that is it. You take it as the gospel. So we need to have a means of feeding the people responsible for these means of communication with a credible, um, with a credible fact such that they disseminate that. We, so in our trainings and all of that, these should be our targets. Um, my colleague Della has mentioned in the chats that we also need to identify identifiable um, the, the religious leaders and all of that. The communities already have leaders. The major problem with most of the trainings we organize is that we go into the communities and pick people that the communities do not recognize. So the people who have been trained to fact check, the people who have been trained to give the credible information are not being listened to the people by the people in the communities. So we need to, in our trainings, target the religious leaders, the market queens and all of that, and teach them the means of verification. Because if a market woman hears something, she's going to her market queen, is this true? And if these are the people we have tooled with uh, training mechanisms, they will be able to say, wait, let me verify. No, this is not what I verified of. Yes, it is true. So in addition to all of these, we need to target the existing leaders and not go, out, go in there and impose leaders on them and impose experts on them. And then we also need to give them community means of verification. Thank you. Uh, Mark, if there's room for one more contribution. Um... Well, so sometimes it's easy to assume that the entire world is on the internet because we just see massive numbers and there's like an information overload. But when you look at the numbers statistically, uh, on average in many African countries, places like Ghana and Nigeria, the internet penetration is just about a little over 30%. Uh, but you compare that to radio, I just checked now and it's nearly 80% in Nigeria. And so the important thing is to understand how people receive information because information is distributed everywhere. You just need to know how they get it. And it could be radio, television, it could be shops where people charge their phones and they have small televisions for entertainment purposes. It could be marketplaces, it could be schools, it could be worship centers. And so we should just focus on those places. It, 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 it should also involve some level of partnership. For example, if you want to, you know, influence this curriculum of public schools, you would have to work with the government. Um, and I think SMS too can, can be a huge resource. I know the United Nations uses SMS to distribute information and collate opinions. 
uh, in some instances, I think that can also be adopted. If, if it's expensive, you can then partner with you know, telecommunications companies or the government to make it cheaper for you to adopt that. Community journalism is also important. It's, it's dying, really. Uh, I was discussing with a colleague some days back about how we used to have investigative reports that were done in local languages and broadcast on TV, but you hardly have those anymore. Everybody is after, you know, the using the English language, they're after grants from foreign donors, and that's easier to get when you operate within that confines. But we need to also encourage uh, newsrooms that want to broadcast exclusively using local languages and make sure that they do quality in-depth reporting and research. And in Nigeria, there's an agency known as the National Orientation Agency. Um, and they have offices in all parts of the country. And you know that's also an area where we can um, reach more audiences if you know if some level of collaboration is engineered. Thank you. Um, and oh, I think that that's a, a good place um, to conclude, to reflect on um, the realities of the African um, information landscape and the need to tailor approaches um, to specific countries, to specific populations, um, and that it is going to take these these kind of dynamic, uh, multi-dimensional approaches to combat disinformation. Um, and I'm I'm tempted to keep peppering you all, our our panelists, with with questions indefinitely. There's a lot more we could go into. Um, we haven't even touched on AI and what might be around the corner. Um, but we'll save that for another day. I'm I'm cognizant of your time, um, so I think we'll wrap up here. Um, but I would like to give a, a huge thank you to our panelists um, for their really inspiring, incredibly thoughtful um, contributions and insights. Um, I'd also like to thank the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center for its partnership and for hosting this conversation um, with the Africa Center. And I would like to thank all the Africa Center and Kofi Annan staff who made it possible. Um, thank you also to the translators um, for making this webinar available in English, French, Portuguese, and Arabic. Um, and thank you um, to you, our audience today, for tuning in. Um, and a reminder that today's conversation will be posted on YouTube um, very soon. Um, please also subscribe to our mailing list, um, continue to follow our website, where we'll have more disinformation publications soon, um, and make sure to join us for our next webinar. So from Washington, D.C., I'm Mark Dirksen. Um, thanks again for joining us today, and have a good rest of your day.